Good afternoon, everyone. This is Roxim Live for January 5th, 2024. I'm Martin McKee. I'm the product designer here at Apogee Components. Uh, Tim is taking a short you know, weekend vacation, so I'm going to take over on this today. I don't have really a solid plan of what we're going to do today, but uh, we'll just look at some things. So with me today, I've got... Well, this is something I've been working on. We'll continue working on and it'll come out uh, in the next months. This is uh, the HiRock, the MX774B HiRock. And this was, boy, one of America's first ICBM designs. Uh, so very similar in look to a V2, but, but not, not a V2. Um, unlike some of the other early American missile attempts, it wasn't actually a modified V2. It was indeed a, a ground-up design. So interesting stuff. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, but I'm really looking forward to answering some of your questions. So go ahead and get those into the chat, and we'll see what we can work on. So I see some things coming up here. Hello from Los Angeles. Oh yes, more Hermes. We are working on production. Well, not as we speak. I'm actually using the laser cutting computer right now. So no laser cutting right now, but more Hermes are coming. They are in production. Uh, Vermont and Mississippi, Utah. So we've got a nice, nice swath of the country so far here. Um, I can take us, just to kind of stay with our high rock here, <laughs> uh, this is kind of the rock sim design for it. Now you'll notice some interesting things, more so about the built than the actual rock sim file. This is, this is an early one, so I haven't gotten all of the parts into this design in Roxim. One of the things to notice is that there's a boat tail. So fins on a boat tail are often interesting. The nose cone actually has an extension, a, a conic extension, um, just, just a cardstock cone. It's not difficult to build, but it is an interesting design. So those are the sorts of things that at some point I will be adding into the Roxim file to make it a little bit more representative. Let's see, nothing new yet. This rocket is intended to fly on, well, it flies on 29 millimeters, and it has just some decorative nozzles around the central 29 millimeter. So it's a single motor rocket, but it looks um, for decoration, for display, like it's for motor cluster. And it should fly really nicely. We've flown it. Um, this is the flight prototype. We flew it on a G54, and it was a beautiful flight, about 1,800 feet, just short of 1,800 feet. Um, it's also flown on some Fs uh, very nicely. So it's a nice kind of balance. Um, it's a, it's a mid-power. Uh, I would not feel comfortable personally putting an H in it. Um, we may try that when the display prototype is done. We may try that in this original prototype because it's fun. You never know. All right. Okay. D advice on the TTV. Uh, so what specifically about the TTV? Uh, we have had, honestly, excellent luck with the TTV. I like flying it with, let's actually take a look at that. That is something. Um, oh, come on. I need to open another Chrome window. So bring that in and we'll take a look. So for those who are not familiar, the TTV is our timer test vehicle, and it is a two-stage rocket, but BT-60 size. So it's a little guy, and it's designed 
to fly basically composite to a composite. It's for electronics. You can fly black powder in both stages, but you don't gain much over doing a gap staged rocket or something like that. It's really intended for electronics, like as mentioned, our simple timer. And the, the upper stage has a position for the electronics, and then the lower stage just uses the ejection charge of the lower stage motor. So kind of advice about this. First off, take your time while building it. I am quite proud of the design, honestly. It works really nicely. It's not difficult to design, but there are a lot of steps and a lot of pieces. So it's something worth just taking a little bit of time to do. Uh, it is, for the most part, self-aligning. So if you take your time, it will be built pretty straight for all of the fuselage stuff. If you also use a fin alignment jig on the fins, it'll fly straight first flight, no problems. Um, so that's easy. And then I always prefer on any two-stage rocket to use a higher thrust motor in the lower stage. So the TTV flies 24 millimeter in the lower stage and 18 millimeter in the upper stage. So what I like to do, and we can go down here to the recommended motors, mm -hmm, way down here. So it will fly on a C11 or a D12 in the bottom stage. I much prefer the Quest D22 for the first stage. Just, it gets you off the launch rod much more quickly you're much more likely to have a nice stable flight if there's a breeze, and it's just a lot easier. And then you can really put anything you want in the upper stage. Um, so that would be one of the things. I would always, always ground test, anytime you're using electronics, ground test with the igniters you're intending to use. So one of the things that can happen with a two-stage rocket is that the upper stage doesn't ignite. And if you're using the simple timer or a lot of the others and some comments here, E30s, E28s, actually yes, you can fly it with the E30s and E28s. So if we take a look here, the D22 up to a C12 takes it up to about 1200 feet, 1250 roughly. Uh, given the fact that the rocket's this big, <laughs> Going up 1,300 feet is going high. If you throw E's, which are down here, um, we don't have the E30 on here. We do have like the E35 or an E20 up to a D. That takes you over 2,000, maybe 2,400 feet. So it, it takes you up quite a ways for a rocket that size. But it does fly beautifully. And going back to ground testing, always ground test with the exact igniters you're planning on using. So if you're gonna fly uh, Quest motors, the first fire micros, ground test with those to ensure that your staging timer plus battery plus igniter will actually light. Because <laughs> it's super frustrating to fly and not have your upper stage ignite. Uh, it's much nicer to just burn one igniter <laughs> and, and be sure. Uh, for upper stage deployment, what I have done for all of the flights that I've done on the TTV is to do uh, motor backup and use the staging timer to use the simple timer for the primary deployment because the simple timer has an Apogee charge and if you just use a Firewire, uh, an E-Match, it's very easy to just use a small black powder charge, um, <laughs> 0.3, maybe 0.5 grams of black powder, and then you have both. So if the upper stage doesn't light, the staging timer still has a very good chance of deploying the parachute and that sort of thing. And then, of course, if something happened with the motor um, deployment charge, you still have the electronic. So those are kind of my big suggestions with that. Let's see, what else do we got? 
just started the demo. I've had Roxim, yes. Uh, so having trouble importing an old design. Hmm. Yeah. So the JG, the MGJ E matches are are excellent for that. Um, I'm not entirely sure what would stop the import. One thing that you can do uh, if you're having import problems is to go ahead and send it to our front desk. So if we go down here to contact us, you can send us the file and we can double check it, um, see if we can figure out what the problem is, um, or just call and talk to our front desk people. They're really great with that sort of thing. If they can't figure it out, then we can also just take a look at your file um, and see if we can figure it out on our end. With it, uh, with just it not importing, I don't know what else uh, or what to tell you. Because <laughs> sometimes there's just little things that keep it from importing for some reason, and we can fix those and then get you back up and running. But if you did want to contact us, then you can go to the contact us portion of our website and just put this in. I don't remember if it allows us to put a Roxon file in directly. If not, you can just say, hey, I'm having this issue. We'll get back to you and you can email uh, directly in that case. Okay, you are asking me stuff beyond my... So I am not the launch visualizer guru, unfortunately. Uh, but the, uh, the question is, use launch visualizer to load an Apogee Aspire and the payload bay that you sell for it and launch it with an Apogee Metalist um, F9. So it's the, it's the F10, but that's okay. And we can get... Let's bring... Let's first... Open it up in Roxim so we can actually look at the design. And do, 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 program files. Okay, so here is just the base, the base Aspire. And if we look at the payload bay, doesn't just come up. Sometimes they'll come up for you and sometimes they don't, but that's all right. Let's look at payload. Mm-hmm. No, of course not. So the 29 millimeter payload bay has a total length of five and a quarter inches. And then there's two couplers that it's constructed with. And it has a total weight of 26.2 grams. So we can modify this. And let's just insert it right in the middle here, because that would be the easiest way uh, when modifying this as it stands to put it in. So we'll do that. And we can just add. body tube after that and we want 29 but we don't want that long we want it shorter than that so it is roughly two inches we want to center it
There's that. And then we can just copy this coupler and put it back a little further. There we go. And then we're going to correct for the weight. And we could do all of these parts separately. But of course, if we're going to fly it with the payload bay, we're probably going to want to also put in some kind of electronics. And so we'll just guess on the weight for that. So this is 26 grams without electronics. Electronics will be 10 to 20 grams. So let's call it maybe 35 grams total additional weight. So then we can, in that spot, add a mass object. We're going to just do a electronics so we can remember what it was. 35 grams. And we will save this to the desktop. Spire with bay. All right, now we can load the F10. There we go. Come on. And set this up. So we can do a quick launch here to just make sure that we've got everything figured out. The time to burn out, I guessed wrong. Go figure. Seven seconds. So what we really want is, eh, we'll do the six second time delay. If you're dealing with weather cocking into the wind or something, you actually want to be on the shorter end of the time delay just so that it doesn't end up going down um, quickly before deployment. So there's that. OK. So now we can also demonstrate this in our 2D. So this is, of course, our standard Roxim where we just have 2D. And that was already set up to be launched at an angle. That's not what we want. Mm. There we go. That'll be better. All right, so let's see what type of altitude we get here. Let's see. OK, so we can look at our Apogee. So our Apogee is, well, 146880. Well, that's in meters. So that is just short of 4,000 feet. That's not bad. Uh, had another question come in. Can the simple timer be used in Apogee detect mode? So with a dummy load, don't even need a dummy load. Uh, if you don't put anything on one of the two channels of the simple timer, it will um, it will run just fine. So it, it doesn't check for continuity and not function if it doesn't find it. So the simple timer can be used either just as a timer or just as the Apogee detect or both. Uh, without adding anything else on. And so when you ask uh, Lewis here, when you ask opening this up for the first time, just Roxim in general, I would probably, I mean, my, my <laughs> what I would suggest with starting Roxim for the first time, I'll save this so we don't lose that. would be to go to the Apogee website and download 
You can search on the computer. There are a number of Apogee rockets that come with Roxim. The only thing is that they're not in the most beautiful directory. <laughs> so you have to go into your Windows folder. It's uh, Program Files x86. And then it will be in your Roxim directory. And then it's Designs. So you can do that. And there's a lot. I don't know what the number is at this point. Um, it's basically every rocket that Apogee has ever sold. So even the ones that we no longer sell continue to be in the list. So it's a couple hundred, maybe more at this point. And then you can just find a rocket. Uh, so you can, we could go to the Apogee and just like I did earlier, open up the Aspire or any of the others, uh, X15, just just cuz. And then you would open that in Rocksim. And I was just doing this from the file manager, so it's not seen it. Rocksim doesn't usually take over the file name. Um, so if you don't open it directly from, do, 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 come on. If you don't open it directly from Rocksim, it won't know exactly what it is sometimes. But yeah, so you just open it up. And what I would do, you can look at the rocket. So at what it has right now is a side view. You can get the top view. You can also look at it from the back or look at it in three dimensions. And you can rotate it around just using the left mouse button. And of course, all of the, in this case, the black, this doesn't have all the decals on it at the moment. But all of this can be customized in Roxim to make it more attractive if, if, want, if you want that. Um, but once you kind of get a look at the rocket, most of the rockets that you get from us, most of the Roxim files, will have motors in them. As it happens, if I go to flight simulations, this doesn't have any. So I would go and I'd choose a motor. And it's still keeping the cert last search that I did. So sometimes this happens where it's not actually showing everything you'd want. And what you kind of have to do is to just choose something in any manufacturer and then go back to all. And we can fly this. Right now it's showing engines that match the mount diameter, which, yeah. The E24 will not take it all that high, but we could fly it on that. Let's see what it does. E24 or 4. The uh, X15 is a heavy rocket. It's a big rocket, uh, really. So then we can just hit launch. And then this gives us, what are we missing? What are we missing? So this is always good. We can double click on the results and it will be annoying. Come on, there we go. And since it gave us this X, that means something went wrong. And we can see if we can figure out what. It never left the launch pad. Not enough thrust, probably. As I said, it's a heavy rocket. Let's just go for a good old-fashioned G80. That flies this one well. So if we get load a G80, and we want to set that probably at a seven second delay, try that. Nope, still doesn't. So our mass, is only 500 grams. This is interesting because that motor is more than enough to get it moving. So we're running into a bug somewhere. Up, oh, up, oh, and I think I see it. We've got pods that are showing zero mass. So if your pod does not actually 
show weight, it's not going to work. So this one was set up in an earlier version of Roxim, and this would be an interesting thing to work on because right now it's not running and we want it to run. So what we can do is look inside and figure out if we can... So this is good. We're getting a positive mass there. Positive mass there. So we can just set these at one gram. Okay, let's give that another try. There we go. So there we go. Um, the X-15, not an ideal rocket to start with simply because it's a really complicated rocket. So if you're looking at doing simple things in Roxim, it's not a, it wasn't a good choice on my part. Um, and it, it might be that it's been a long time, uh, Robert, since using the program, or it might just be a small thing in the file. It, these things do happen sometimes. So, another question, uh, Jeff, have we thought of upscaling the TTV? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is, I mean, on my, on my door, there's a lift, list of upcoming projects, and I don't know when it's going to be complete, but the idea at the moment is probably 29 to 29, 3 inch. Uh, basically just a bigger version of the TTV. Uh, so yes, that is in the works. <laughs> um, so let's see. All right. Uh, what else do we got? And Howdy to you as well, Art. Coming in from Texas. <laughs> I know, put me on the list for that one too, for the bigger TTV. I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Let's see. So I'm going to open up the, uh, hmm, we don't need to save that. All right. Maybe go back here. Any other questions that people have? Because as I said, I didn't plan anything today. I usually like planning, but it was kind of a last minute thing. So one of the things that we just released was the, the catalyst and um, has proven to be popular, which of course makes all of us happy. <laughs> but one of the things about the catalyst that's really interesting is just how flexible it is. Um, so the catalyst is based on Basically, it's the same size as this. It's three inch tube, same three inch nose cone. And uh, what I found really interesting working on it, I'm gonna download the Roxim file because I know I don't have it on this computer. One of the things I found interesting in working on it when I was building out the recommended motor list is that uh, it actually can safely be flown 
on an S to Z16, uh, kind of as the, the smallest motor that it'll fly on. Obviously, there are some 24 millimeter E's, uh, the E20 and the E28 that were mentioned earlier. Um, but the, those, are, those are higher thrusts. So it'll fly on the E16. The e, uh, but the thing is, it will also fly very nicely, as it happens, on up to like an H169 with no nose weight. So it's, it's one of the more flexible things we have on the, on the market at this point. Um, okay, so question about building season and flying season. Do we have a building season? here in Colorado or do we fly year-round? We fly year-round. Uh, this morning we woke up to snow and ice and almost all of us were in late. <laughs> uh, so today would not be a day we would fly. Uh, tomorrow there's a launch and I expect that it will happen. Uh, these are the joys of living in Colorado. So we do indeed have that. Um, why the 774? Uh, because I like it. <laughs> so I want us to have more scale, but not necessarily just ridiculous, super hard scale. And one of the things that's nice about the High Rock is that it's, there aren't a lot of models of it. We could do another thing that there's a lot of models of it, but I didn't want to do that. It also uses our new three inch nose cone for both the nose cone and the boat tail. So that was really nice use of parts that we already had. And it's just an interesting design. Um, it's, it is very V2 like. So, it, it fits in that kind of thing, but it's not a, a standard sounding rocket type scale project. So it was a nice change from that sort of thing. So that was the main thing on that. Yeah. I, Robert, I think you're really going to enjoy actually both of those rockets. The Aspire is it's a heck of a it's a heck of a rocket. You put a big motor in there and it really goes. And the catalyst is is the same, honestly. Um, ah, question about the Blue Raven altimeter. So I have used it. I've done a couple of flights with it and I I really like it. Um, hints like with any electronics, ground test. Always, always ground test. But the nice thing with the Blue Raven is that it makes it super easy to ground test. <laughs> so everything is on your phone or tablet. Uh, there is an app that works with either Apple, iOS, or Android. And you can do ground tests. You can do simulations uh, that will do the full it'll fire all the pyros um, as well if you load the pyros and it does all of the recording of the data so it makes it incredibly easy to test fly um, one thing that i would say is make sure that you have a certain amount of wire and heat shrink tubing uh, just to do the wiring because it is such a compact design it doesn't actually have enough outputs to plug both sides of the igniter in. So let me bring up, if I can spell, I'll bring it up so we can see it here. All right, the Blue Raven. So the Blue Raven is a four channel dual deployment altimeter that fits in a 24 millimeter tube. It's tiny. So it only has six connections on the end for 
the four channels and battery, which basically means that you have to connect those external to it. Um, so you would run from the positive side to the Apogee charge, from the positive side to the main charge, from the positive side to the third and fourth channels, um, which just means that you need a little bit more uh, electronics ability. I mean, very tiny. It doesn't take much. It's easy enough. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great. It's really nice. So, <laughs> I'd like a two-stage scale sounding rocket, two inch and bigger. That's another one that is not currently on the list as scheduled, but is definitely on the list as something we want to do. Um, and the main reason it's not scheduled is that we haven't actually decided what prototype we would like to use. So we sell the lock um, Nike Tomahawk and you know then the modifications we have for the eBay and that sort of thing, we would definitely like our own version of something like that. Uh, but it's not currently on currently on the list, but definitely something that we would like to have. Um, moving forward, I don't know how big we're going to go. Obviously, we have lots of 4-inch um, parts that are our own. We don't have anything larger than that. And that's a possibility, or we may stay kind of in the up to 4-inch range. But in any case, I do know that we want to push more into mid-power and high-power options. So a, a higher power two-stage, yeah, the, the one that's on the list is going to be simple, just like the TTV. Um, you know, just make it easy to, to get reps in flying two-stage. But having something... Uh, a sounding rocket of some sort would be great. I mean, on a personal project of mine is I'm working on a three-stage Black Brandt 11. That's, you know, I mean, that, that sort of thing's fun. <laughs> it's just harder to make a product out of that sometimes. Um, and thank you on the AI article. That, it was fun. And yeah, the, the issue with going above four inches, it's just, it's really expensive. And... Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually managed to get down to our location here, but we're kind of packed at the moment. <laughs> Going any bigger than four inches is not good for our warehouse either. Um, so yes, this is a planned kit. Uh, this is I'm building our display model here, and uh, this was our flight test model. This is the MX774B High Rock, um, early ICBM sounding rocket project. Uh, not, a, not a super successful one as it happens, but uh, it was not actually the rocket that, that had failures. It was recovery system stuff for the most part. So it's an interesting rocket. It will be out soonish. I don't know. Um, let, we're still doing, you know, build and then have to do instructions and production, and so it's it, it'll be a bit. So I have a question for everyone watching. There are comments on the AI article, which I'm glad that it's was liked. The question then is. Did it make you think of anything? Did you have any ideas as a result of it? Were the kind of really simple thoughts that I had in the article, um, so like a help system or design assistance, generative design assistance, are those interesting ideas? Are those sorts of things 
that would be fun for people? And another question that came in, did you ever get Draco onboard video? No, and the, the annoying thing is, well, okay, yes we did, but the camera shut off halfway through the flight. So we got boost and then nothing, which, go figure, right? Hmm. Thoughts, ideas, questions? Nothing coming in right now. All right. So going, going back to the High Rock just for a second, um, I'm actually going to change the settings here because although I generally prefer meters, it's not necessarily something that everybody prefers. So let's go to G's. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, Robert, don't worry about the being old part. I, uh, I, as I said in the article, I went to school for computer science and focused an awful lot on AI and I'm still soaking it in. So not, not a thing to worry about. Um, yeah, I, Jeff, I think that the AI Sims or connecting AI with Sims uh, could be maybe the best piece of all of that. Be, the idea of being able to, well, something like the Blue Raven that we talked about not too long ago, download the data from that and have AI look at that in a sim and actually be able to make something of that, I think that's helpful. <laughs> Can AI simulate a wind tunnel and it claimed it could do work on that level? Uh, actually, yes. Um, what is his name? So there's a professor at the University of Washington, Steve Brunton. He has great YouTube channel, actually. And it's, it's pretty high level, so I wouldn't just say go over there for a fun afternoon. But one of the things that he's very interested in is using machine learning, AI of different sorts, to help with fluid simulations, uh, wind tunnel simulations. Although what he's really interested in is large scale stuff. So like weather flow over islands, which obviously you, you can't build a wind tunnel for that. Uh, the scale doesn't work. So the idea is if you can get AI or machine learning of some sort to help with just the, the big simulation, so the, the main vortices, that sort of thing, then you can use other methods to get more detailed stuff. But yeah, they have been able to do simulations at, and yes, you've got CFD, com, uh, computational fluid dynamics, is excellent. The problem with computational fluid dynamics is it's very expensive computationally. It takes a lot of processor power um, to do computational fluid dynamics. And not everyone has that. And even when you have it, not everyone is really able to wait. <laughs> and the thing that they found with the machine learning approach is that they're able to take that same, just the overall fluid and run a basic simulation of it using machine learning in just a fraction of the time that computational fluid dynamics takes. So it allows you to get a, a very basic idea of how a system's going to work without having to run a full CFD simulation. And I know Roxim isn't doing CFD at the moment. I, 
I, I doubt it would really surprise anybody that it has been something we've talked about. It has also been something that we have been very certain is not going to happen right now because it's it's expensive and it's difficult um, on our end. But it, it sure would be fun. It sure would be fun to have full CFD simulation in, in rock sim. Um, in an ideal world, I guess. Any other rock sim, AI, general rocketry, climate of Colorado questions? <laughs> I have to admit, so Jeff suggests that we need to sell a wind tunnel. And uh, I think that's going to run into the same issue that we have with going bigger than four inch. Uh, it, it ends up expensive and it, it takes up a lot of space. Even small wind tunnels take up a lot of space. I, I don't know that our warehouse people would like that. <laughs> so about paint, what about paint? Because I, I am certainly not a paint expert, but I do, I, I do a decent job. I can do paint. So do, do we use rattle cans? Yes, almost, almost exclusively. Uh, we do have airbrush setups and we have in the past sometimes used uh, like two-part automotive paints and things like that and they give absolutely outstanding results. Um, they're a pain. <laughs> so we will generally stick with rattle can spray paint basically just because we need to get things done quickly. Um, you know, as much as I'd like to spend all the time I wanted to on building any one, any one rocket to go out at our showroom, we just, there's work to do and rattle can is the fastest way to do it. But having said that, a, a little bit of care with rattle can paint can lead to really nice paint jobs. And one of the things that um, <laughs> we'll do some more paint, Jeff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so one of the things to, to get a good paint job with rattle can paint is to make sure that the surface you're applying it to is already good. Obviously, I've done no prep on, I've done no prep on my, uh, display model here because it's still being built. And as a matter of fact, the fins aren't even attached yet. So yeah, it's, it's got a little ways before it gets paint. But um, you make sure that the surface is very nice before you put on the paint. And that means you fill any spiral grooves, you do a couple of coats of primer. So you get a, a general primer coat on, and then do a overall coat of primer, a light one, just to make sure that it's all uniform and sand between the primer coats. And then do a couple of coats of the rattle can paint, maybe, well, it depends on the paint, follow the directions from the manufacturer, but usually 10 to 20 minutes between coats, do nice light coats, and you can get a really nice paint job with rattle can paint. So yeah. Um, question about, is it better to do mass on each component or mass override? Um, it really depends what you want. So if I go back to Roxim here and let me bring up the view so you can see it. 
So in here, as I said earlier, this is a very early uh, Roxim file. It's not something that I'm being really careful with everything. But one thing I did do is I put a mass object in the nose. And the reason I did that was that I just, I wasn't sure if I was going to need nose weight. And so right now, you can see the mass object is, is 0.1 grams, which basically means it doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, I found that I didn't need it. But if I had done this with a mass override, I would have had to manually adjust the location of the center of gravity. And that's just, that's, that's too much of a pain in the rear. I don't want to deal with that. So in that case, using a component where I'm specifically setting that mass is nice. Now, of course, I could go out here. I could modify the mass of this nose cone. And I will usually do that. So here, it's showing the nose cone as 114 grams. That is pretty typical for the nose cone, for our three inch nose cone. That's a little heavy. Um, they're usually like 112. But if I was going to use this nose cone, instead of a mass override, I'd adjust the wall thickness until I got to its weight. But the big thing is, what is your goal? As I said, this model in Roxim was designed just to get a very rough idea of what motors are going to do in it. I just needed something that was the right weight and had roughly the right fins and body diameter so that the drag was accurate. In that case, any way that you can get the mass correct and it's not going to make your center of gravity just completely off. I mean, obviously, I can um, do a mass override and say the sustainer is 500 grams. Turn it on. 500 grams, and the center of gravity is at 3 inches. Well, now it's way up here. That's wrong. <laughs> I know that that's wrong, um, which is why I don't like doing a full mass override. But if I weigh this rocket, and then I find where the center of gravity is, all of a sudden, I have the exact characteristics of this rocket. And that means that I can check stability very accurately. So I'm totally guessing here. But if it's 25 inches, eh, a little, little further forward. But so here, that gives me 1.88 margin of stability. It's, it's not that stable because it has no motor right now. Um, let's load something. Let's load something ridiculous. H135. So there we go. 1.15 margin of stability. Um, so if you do a full rocket mass override and you measure where the center of gravity sits, you can get a very accurate stability. Um, and you can do that. You can do the same thing by just going through every single piece. The problem is when you put glue on, when you put paint on, are you accurate with that stuff? So usually I'll leave it towards the end to just get that accurate that way. <laughs> a wind tunnel in Cave of the Winds? Ah! That, that might not actually be a bad idea because, uh, yeah, depending upon which direction the wind is going, you don't even have to put anything new in. Yeah, Bob does do really beautiful work with spray paint. I, there's, there's plenty of people that I really wish I could do that well. <laughs> I, I do well, but yeah, yes. Um, and I didn't mention that. Attack cloth. You want your rocket clean before you're painting. So after sanding and, and before painting. So what I will usually do is um, give it a wipe down with alcohol. After that dries, tack cloth. Because, yes, it's always, always annoying to find a little, little spot on your rocket because you had 
just a little bit of dust from sanding. <laughs> a little bit that landed on it. it, even if it's not from sanding, just something that settled on it out of the air. That's always annoying. Ruins your paint job for, for nothing, really. And yeah, there are plenty, there are plenty of people, Terry, that fly naked rockets. It's a thing I have gotten in the habit of, of painting my rockets, um, but boy, it's tempting sometimes to just get out and fly, I'll tell you what. All right, so, oh, all in all, I think we made some interesting progress here, talked about some interesting stuff. Um, going forward this year, um, of course, last year we released 12 kits. <laughs> that is not the goal this year, just so everyone knows. Um, we're going for slightly more advanced kits this year, and we're, we're hoping to release more parts also. So if there are parts that people feel we really need, let us know. Um, I mean, at any time. We always like being able to fill in those holes, fill in those gaps in our parts catalog, but especially this year, because that's kind of going to be one of our big goals, is to make sure we have all the parts that make your build just that much easier and more successful. So, thank you all for coming. You have a, you have a wind tunnel, Terry? That's not fair. We need a wind tunnel. I want a wind tunnel. Uh, I did get to work, I did get to work on a subsonic wind tunnel for a while. It was quite a bit of fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad to have everyone here. It's been a great, great short little afternoon here. Um, are there any other questions, thoughts? If not, I'll go ahead and close it down here pretty soon. Give it a few seconds here to see if anything comes through. All right, looks like we don't have any more questions, so we'll go ahead and, and call it there. Thank you all for being here. As always, our goal here is to help you be more successful with your rocket projects. And uh, we would love to hear from you if you have thoughts, if you have ideas, if you have questions, go ahead and give us a call. We always do our best to help. Let's see, do you print your color and decals on rockets yet? Sadly, no. Sadly, no. It's still flat before they get on the rocket. But is what it is, I suppose. Ah, what percent stability on Roxim should we aim for? So that's, that's a can of worms right there. Um, the stability margin here is in calipers. Uh, so one is the minimum that you generally want. Going up to about two is fine. Going above two, you're likely to just weathercock, just tilt into the wind. Um, Percentage-wise, somewhere between 8 and 15 percent the length of the rocket is generally considered good. So between one and two calipers, or one and two times the, the diameter of the rocket, and then percentage-wise, between 8 and 15 percent the total length of the rocket. And you can change that um, setting in, in Roxim if you want. So I think we're going to call that there. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon and uh, Happy New Year.